sing and welcome to church. Let's all stand together and we're going to sing the first Noel. great singing and be seated please and we're so glad to have you in the service this evening and winter has has come back to us hasn't it and it's good to have a lot of our choir and orchestra members with us tonight they've got the night off after a much deserved uh, hard work uh, for the great program I was telling someone uh, this week they said uh, what do you want for Christmas I said I've already received it they said you did and I said yeah I said, what did you get? I said, our choir and orchestra gave me the greatest gift on Sunday. And, and that program was just tremendous. Our drama teams. And uh, I have just been rejoicing in all that God did. We had 671 people here. And uh, just to, to God be the glory, what a great, great uh, program that was. And just continue to pray for those that heard the gospel that uh, they will now respond to the gospel. And we know that that will happen in the days ahead. A couple of announcements for you. Don't forget, if you would like to be a part of a Christmas card exchange, we've got a great deal for you. You don't even have to pay postage. Just bring your card and put it out here in the in the little mailbox. And uh, we've got some uh, folks that will sort, uh, sort those by uh, by different names. And, uh, and make sure you stop by to look because there are some cards out there for you. And uh, you can do that, and you don't even have to pay postage. Just a great way to exchange cards. And then our Children's Church Christmas party is this Sunday, and it's going to take place in the cafeteria during the morning service. And so moms and dads, when you get ready to pick up your children, just pick them up from the cafeteria this Sunday. And uh, that will be uh, this uh, a great program for them. And then they're going to take a couple of weeks off. And so I hope that you'll be a part of that. And then if you're part of the Joy Club, you've got a potluck lunch this Sunday following the morning service so when the kids are done with with their um, activity then the joy club is going to move right into the cafeteria and we'll have a great time together and don't forget our Christmas Eve service but our Christmas Eve service is on a Sunday morning all right and so don't forget that. It's a big, big service. We're going to have the Lord's Supper. It's going to be tremendous, but that'll be at 1045. And so I hope that you'll just make a mental note of that. Most of the time you say Christmas Eve, everybody thinks it's in the evening, and obviously. Uh, but we're going to be having and observing that service in the morning. I want to mention also just a couple of things by way of prayer requests and answers to prayer. Uh, I'm so glad that uh, Wendy could be here tonight. Wendy Wisner, we've been praying for her. We, I mentioned to her you last week about her uh, breaking her um, her foot there in four different places and so 
Uh, I'm glad she could be here, and uh, right now it doesn't look like there's going to have to be any surgery, but there's still a couple of things I want you to pray for. Pray for a, a ligament to heal and a tendon to heal. And as long as that happens, then we can probably make it through this without surgery, which would just be wonderful. And then I've talked with a number of you that have been uh, sick with a, a, some kind of sickness that's going on for about four to six weeks, and you've got um, a cough that kind of comes and goes, and it just seems like we've got a lot of people with that, and sometimes it's even gotten down to the children. So pray for one another uh, during this time as well. And uh, don't forget that tonight is going to be the last night that we will be having our Magnify the Word series with Mr. Ains until January the 3rd. So we'll take a couple of weeks off. We're still going to have the service in here, uh, but we won't be doing Magnify the Word until January the 3rd, and then we'll resume that. And uh, don't forget to pray also for our students at GCA. They have started exams this week. And I want you to pray that the Lord would help them to do the very best that they can. And uh, pray for our teachers too. And uh, you can tell that these kids are ready for Christmas break. And so uh, much prayer for the teachers right now, all right? I'm going to ask Brother Chris Haddock to come, and he's going to share uh, something from our mission prayer band. And then we're going to have a season of prayer over our missionaries, and then Brother Ains is going to come and share the word with us. Thank you, Pastor, and good evening, everyone. Uh, tonight, I'm pleased to be able to shine our missionary spotlight on Brother Mark Mariner and his wife Emily and their beautiful family. You see a picture of them up on the screen. Many of you may remember the Mariners. They were with us two years ago in our missions conference back in October of 2021. Doesn't seem like it's been that long, but it has. And at that time, they were traveling around during their deputation raising support and have a number of updates to provide for them that I'd like to share with you tonight. They were able to successfully complete their deputation and raise all of their support. And so in April of 2022, last year, they were able to leave for the mission field and arrive in Guyana, which is a neighboring country to the country of Suriname to which they've been called. Suriname was a place I wasn't familiar with, but it is in the northernmost part of South America, just directly north of Brazil small country there and one that I don't believe we had a missionary serving in prior to the Mariners going there and so they arrived in Guyana um, in April of last year and um, started serving there at Victory Baptist Church and also served in New Life Baptist Church there in Guyana over the past 18 months. Um, during that period of time, their, their daughter Faith, who you see on the screen, was born. And then just this past spring, their baby boy William was born. So they've added two beautiful children to their family since the last time that we saw them. And they are uh, all, all on the mission field together. Over the past year and a half, they have been learning the Spanish language, studying in language school to be able to communicate fluently there. They've been leading music and outreach programs. They've had opportunities to disciple new believers, and they've had opportunities to share the gospel with many families in the communities around the churches that they were serving in. In October of, just, of this year, just a couple of months ago, praise the Lord, they were able to transition from Guyana into Suriname, which is the country that they have been called to um, for, for the number of years that they, since, uh, since they answered the call to become missionaries. And so they're very excited to now be in Suriname and to be establishing, establishing themselves and beginning to, make, to build relationships and share the gospel with people there. And so a number of praises that they wanted to share, first of all, for all that God has done. First of all, they re all received their temporary visas in order to be able to arrive uh, in Suriname in October. And that was a blessing. And I think Brother Zach was doing the missionary um, uh, prayer time last week, and he mentioned that missionaries always pray about visas. It's just a constant ongoing prayer request, whether it be temporary, permanent, whatever it may be. So we praise the Lord for the fact that they all have their temporary visas to be able to be there together. The Lord has also provided housing for them and a vehicle within their first 30 days being in Suriname, and that was an immediate concern and a prayer request, and that has been provided, and we praise the Lord for that. They specifically asked in their most recent prayer letter to us that we mention uh, that they are so thankful for the partnership and the prayers and, and the support of all of the local churches that has enabled them to begin to, to begin to minister there to the people of Suriname, who the Lord had placed on their hearts several years ago when they answered the call to become missionaries. 
prayer requests for this family. They ask that we pray that the Lord will open doors and lead them to be able to share the gospel and establish meaningful relationships with the people in their new community. You can imagine a young family with two very young children uh, moving into an area where, where they really don't know anyone and beginning to build those relationships in a new language and uh, begin to make connections and build relationships with people that hopefully will be the beginnings of their new church plant. They ask that we pray for them during their transition as they adjust to life in Suriname. There are cultural differences uh, between the people of Suriname and the people of Guyana, even though those are neighboring countries. And um, they ask that we pray for them as they begin to better understand those cultural differences and how to best communicate and how to best assimilate into their culture. Suriname has a large Dutch-speaking population, and so it is, the Lord has placed it on Brother Mark's heart um, and Emily's heart to be able to learn the Dutch language and to be able to speak it in addition to the Spanish that they're learning. And so they're, they're actually going to language school and learning those, those two languages simultaneously so that they can speak uh, and share the gospel both in the Dutch language and in the Spanish language, and that's a tall task. And so we ask that we pray for them around that so that they'll be able to communicate with the people that they minister to. Um, finally, they have already begun, as I mentioned before, uh, they have received their temporary visas, so they've already begun working on the permanent visas. And they ask that we pray for them about that, uh, that the process will be smooth, that there won't be too much bureaucracy or time involved, and that this process will go for, well for them so that they can obtain their permanent residency. And so I'd like to ask each of us to just spend some time together tonight praying for these prayer requests that, were, that are on the screen, as well as the praises that they mentioned. And after a few minutes of that time, I'll come back and close us in prayer.
Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to present uh, Brother Mark and Emily and their precious family tonight, and we thank you for the opportunity to partner with them and to support them as missionaries to Suriname, and we thank you for the opportunity most of all to pray for them tonight. And fathers, we lift them up before you. We thank you for everything that you have done for them to allow them to reach the mission field, to allow them to be able to serve for the last 18 months in South America and begin to learn the culture and now to assimilate into Suriname, the country that you've led them to and called them to over the past few years, to work with the people there and to share the gospel and uh, to lead them to Jesus. And we thank you, dear Lord, for the work that they're doing. And Lord, as we bring this young family before you in a time, I know that Pastor has mentioned, um, so many missionaries are no longer on the field and we have such a need for missionaries to go to the field. We're just so thankful for, uh, for families like Brother Mark and Emily um, to, to go and to answer the call and to, um, to share the gospel with those who need to hear in a foreign land. And we pray that you would bless them and we pray that you would watch over them and protect them, Lord. And we thank you for your hand upon them. We pray, Father, that you would help them to build the relationships and establish the connections in their new community that they need in order to be able to start a church um, and, Lord, in order to be able to win souls and lead people to Jesus. We ask, dear Lord, that you would bless them through their transition there in, your, in Suriname. I know that it's a different culture. Brother Mark talks about that in his letter, some adjustments that they're trying to make and some, um, some things that they need to understand culturally. And I pray that uh, those things are very important, and I pray that you would help them to be able to make those adjustments and those assimilations and to be able to minister to uh, the Spanish and Dutch-speaking people uh, who reside there. And Father, along those lines, they're working to learn the languages uh, that they need in order to be able to communicate well and to speak fluently. And I pray that you would bless them uh, as they continue to study and to learn and to, and to communicate with those that they have an opportunity to minister to. And finally, we pray, dear Lord, that you would just um, bless them as they work towards obtaining their visas and help them to be able to obtain permanent residency there without much difficulty or process or um, an extended period of time. We thank you, Lord, for blessing them through that process. We praise you for what you've done for them already. And we thank you for the churches that are supporting them, uh, for the provisions that you've made for housing and for transportation. And we just ask that you would continue to meet their needs. And we thank you, Lord, for your blessings upon them. And Father, here at home, we thank you so much for the service that we had this past Sunday. We thank you for our choir and our orchestra and the work and the time and the effort and our drama team that they put into such a wonderful um, presentation of the gospel through the program that we had. And we know that they were a number here who were unsaved who heard the gospel and that seeds were planted in those hearts and I pray dear Lord that they would respond to the message that was presented and that they would come to know you as their Lord and Savior uh, through the presentation and through the information that they received we pray for Miss Wendy dear Lord we thank you so much that it sounds like she may not need surgery that is such a blessing I pray for healing dear Lord for her ligament and for her tendon uh, that she would heal fully and completely and that you would just touch her dear Lord and strengthen her and bless her each day and we thank you for your hand upon her and what for what you've already done and for what you're going to do we pray for those who are sick um, there's so much sickness going around right now and especially at this time of year it's a very difficult time to be unwell we just pray that you would touch those who are sick who have been dealing with things for the past several weeks that you would touch their bodies and strengthen them the lord and bless them and restore them to full health we pray for our students and our teachers and our staff here at Greenville Christian Academy who are uh, finishing up exams this week, tomorrow and Friday. Uh, we ask that you would just help them, dear Lord, through these final two days to, to do their best and, um, and to work through the things that they need to work to, through to finish the semester well. And we thank you for uh, everyone who is working with them and for everything that happens in this school on a daily basis. We love you and we thank you for the blessing of it. And Father, we just thank you again for the opportunity to meet tonight and to pray and to lift up our missionaries. And we ask that you would just continue to watch over them and protect them. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you, Brother Chris. What a wonderful report, missions reports. It's good to see you here tonight. And uh, our objective tonight is we've got to stay awake. Amen. And uh, Pastor mentioned, and we prayed for the students at GCA. They're in the process of taking uh, exams. And uh, I teach four classes here at the school, and I gave two exams today and got them graded. And... Uh, but it reminds me of um, when I was teaching at another school. I got a note from a parent that said, uh, Mr. Haynes, please excuse Ty. He has a science headache. And um, I think what she meant was he has a sinus headache. And, uh, but I said, hey, no problem at all. I've had a few of those myself, and being a history teacher. But uh, anyway, you continue to pray uh, for the students. And can I just mention that one of the privileges of being able to be in Christian education and being able to teach 
uh, at a Christian school is when they get ready to take a test or an exam, especially an exam like today, you know, we have the privilege um, as teachers uh, to pray for them. Did you ever get the impression growing up in school, having a teacher, it was almost teacher against student, almost can I make this test so hard that I will break you or uh, I will upset you? And of course, we have an academic standard, but by the same token, what a privilege to be able to bow our heads together. And I tell the students, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray for you that you'll have good recall, all right, uh, that you'll be able to uh, not be distracted, that's important, uh, that you'll have um, the ability to have good reasoning skills, all right, because some of these kids are very, very nervous when it's time to take an exam. And uh, they're over there, they're praying, they're burning incense, they're uh, just hoping, just hoping they'll be able to get through uh, the process. But it is good to see you tonight. And uh, as Pastor mentioned, we're gonna kind of wrap up uh, part of our lesson this evening, and then we'll transition. If you have your Bibles, would you go ahead and turn to, to uh, Genesis chapter 18? We got part of the way through that two weeks ago. Um, last Wednesday, we were... Uh, I was with a bunch of students and parents in Washington, D.C. We had a group of about 58, and we had three days there to be able, uh, in the, on the ninth grade trip, to go and see and do an awful lot there in our nation's capital. But tonight, you know, this is, this is not an easy uh, subject for us to cover here in chapter 18 and also in chapter number 19. Uh, tonight, we're covering the topic of destruction, and uh, that doesn't sound very edifying on a Christmas, uh, getting close to Christmas and talking about things. Um, if, you, if we weren't systematically going through this study, I certainly wouldn't choose Genesis 18 and 19 for this time of the year or even to really talk about this topic. There are some things in the Bible that are very difficult, some things that are uncomfortable, uh, but it is God's holy word. He is a perfect God. He knows what our needs are. And he knows that these are things that we deal with uh, throughout our life. And so tonight we're thinking about the destruction, but the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and these other cities that we find here in Genesis chapter number 18. There are actually five cities that we see here. And we're also confronted with the fact that there's a dark side to humanity that we see that comes out here. Things that are just not very edifying. They're not very complimentary. And we've said this many times before, that's the wonderful thing about the Word of God, is that God gave us exactly what we needed in His Word of all the wonderful, great, and, and mighty things uh, that He has given us and all the blessings, but at the same time, giving us a realistic picture of humanity, giving us a realistic picture of man's heart. The Bible says that our heart is deceitful above all things, and what? And desperately wicked. That's not very complimentary, but it's the truth. It is reality. The wonderful thing about that is that God can take that heart and he can change it and he can cleanse us and he can make us a child of God, which is uh, amazing. So there's some cringeworthy moments that we see here in this part, and it exposes what I would consider to be the depths of sin and the depravity of man as we go through here. So uh, tonight... What we'd like to think about and talk about is this idea of how that God destroyed these cities, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and the other three cities. And so in our lesson, I was thinking, uh, when you think of destruction in your mind, just utter destruction, then what comes to mind? You know, we have seen the images of Gaza over in the Middle East and the damage that has been done there. And in my mind, as I see the news, I think to myself, Hamas, is this what you wanted for your people? You really care about your people? Look at what you have caused, all right? Look at the destruction. Um, but it doesn't have to be Gaza. You know, in your mind, you may be thinking of the Ukraine, an ongoing conflict there, or even natural things. I remember seeing the news and watching the news about uh, an F5 tornado that went through Joplin, Missouri, and just wiped out that community. You know, a lot of times after a storm like that, people say it was hard to, to figure out, you know, where our house was. For those people, it was hard to figure out where the neighborhood was. There was so much destruction. And so we think about that. We think about Hiroshima, or we think about wildfires and the damage and the destruction that can be done. 
and the list goes on and on. But let me just, uh, for uh, brevity's sake, let me just mention one example tonight, if I could, and that is an explosion that took place in August of 2020 in Beirut, at the Beirut Harbor. This is just a, a few hundred uh, meters from the school where I attended there in Beirut. And this is the harbor. There was this large uh, grain silo there. But unfortunately, there were thousands of tons of ammonia nitrate that had been stored there for like a six-year period of time. And uh, what's it, what was it doing there? Well, eventually it was going to go through the hands of Hezbollah to Iran and back uh, because, you know, they were going to use it for terrorism and nefarious purposes. And so there was this grain silo here that included an awful lot of food that the Lebanese people needed. And the, the time of August 20 was what? It was COVID worldwide. On top of that, the, the value of their money had just devaluated to the point where it was worthless, and then on top of this, they had this explosion. So just to give you an idea, it was 2,700 tons of ammonia nitrate, which is used as a fertilizer, but a highly explosive, as you can imagine. In fact, when I was sitting at my desk and I saw the explosion to start with, and, the, and it was taken from these two Lebanese guys who were in a boat off the coast of Beirut, I said to myself, that's computer generated. You know, it, it just looks fake. It looks like something in the movies. This isn't real. And then, of course, we began to read all the reports of uh, what had taken place and what had happened. You know, the explosion was felt, think about this, in the neighboring countries of Syria and Turkey and in parts of Europe, 150 miles away. That's like from here to Greensboro is the island of Cyprus, and they heard the explosion at that time. How, how big of a devastation was it? Well, let me give you some stats here, just as an idea. 218 people died, 7,000 injured. It's, not, it's a wonder it wasn't more than that. $15 billion in damage throughout the capital, the city of Beirut. 300,000 people, their homes were basically destroyed. They were out on the street. And in addition to that, the sad thing is, to this day, there's no accountability. They continue to blame each other, politicians and the corruption, and no one's gotten to the bottom of it. And most importantly, there's no uh, restitution there for the people that really suffered. Um, one of the things that I think about in, in relation uh, to this particular um, situation, as I mentioned, is the fact that there was so much destruction and it was so widespread. When we think about Sodom and Gomorrah, we can sometimes maybe overlook the fact that there was utter destruction in the southern part of the Dead Sea as we know it. And uh, in Genesis chapter number 18 is where uh, we would just, I'd just like to read a couple of verses to start with here. In verse number 16, the Bible says, and the men rose up from thence. Now, who are the men? Now, these are the three men who came to minister to Abraham and to give him information about what was going on. They told him, of course, that it wasn't uh, Eliezer, his servant, and it was not um, Ishmael, but it would be a son that Sarah would bear, even though she was barren, and that she was of uh, advanced years. And uh, the information was given, and Sarah laughed, all right? And so that ended in verse number 15, uh, where Sarah denied, saying, I laughed, for she was afraid, and he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. This is the angel of the Lord. This is what we refer to as a Christophany, uh, where uh, the Lord comes and speaks to uh, Abraham here. And it says, And the men rose up from thence and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way, almost like on the way out the front door. Hey, let me walk with you just a little bit, a little ways. And it's interesting, in verse number 17, it says, And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Now, that's a very interesting statement. We're going to come back to that. So let me just mention that by way of a background. Some of you have not been in here uh, and you haven't heard these lessons. But in Genesis 13, we learned that Lot was given a choice by his uncle Abraham as far as the direction they would go. They needed to part. You remember the Sunday school stories. And Abraham basically said, look, you go this way and I'll go this way or vice versa. But I'll give you choice. Uh, the plot of land that would be chosen was up, to, uh, was up to Lot. And I've said before, 
Lot would have been uh, much better off if he'd have said, uh, look, Uncle Abraham, can you, you just go ahead and decide because you know what's best and you know what's best for me. But that was not the case. His decision would affect him for the rest of his life. He chose the well-watered plains of Jordan. We talked about that. This meant he also chose, because of its location, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. By Genesis 14, Lot is living in Sodom. He was carried away as a captive and had to be rescued by Abraham and his men, some 300 men that went and defeated the enemy and, and released them uh, from captivity. And then uh, the Bible says in verse number 12, and they took Lot, Abraham's uh, brother's son who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. And so even after being rescued, Look at this, Lot returns to live in Sodom. There's an awful lot we could say about that. You see, Lot didn't influence Sodom. Sodom influenced Lot. The love of Sodom is enough to suppress the danger and wickedness in his mind. There's so much money to be made. There's so much influence there. There's so much notoriety. After all, I could be one of the men in the city gates, which is where he ended up, and... Uh, at the same time, suppressing the idea that there's an awful lot of wickedness going on in this city that is displeasing to God. So by Genesis 18, there is a set of parenthetical verses. There's a, what we mean by that is it, it kind of pauses and gives us God's thoughts. And we'll pick up there in verse number 17. Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, and he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it which has come unto me, and if not, I will know it. So in verse number, uh, the Lord is speaking here in first person as he describes to Abraham, uh, or describes Abraham and what he's about to do. This is interesting that God would include this type of information that he gives us. In verse number 19, I think is one of the most remarkable verses in the Bible. Verse number 19 details God's affirmation of Abraham's faith and his confidence in Abraham's determination to lead his family in righteousness. You know, if you ever wanted an endorsement, this would be the type of endorsement that you would want, whether it's from your boss or whether it's from a relative or whether it's from, of course, from the Lord, that would be unbelievable. You know, the idea here in verse number 19, let's look at it one more time. He said, for I know him. And we read over that little phrase, for I know him, but it is so powerful. The idea is long and much well past the idea that I'm acquainted with him. No, this is, this is the confidence that God has in Abraham. This is the same confidence that's going to cause him in chapter number 22 to say to Abraham, I want you to take your firstborn and head for Mount Moriah. That's an amazing thought when we think about it. You know, the, the, the Bible says in verse 18, or chapter 18, verse 19, I know him. What's he going to do? He's going to command his children, his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord. Wow, what a testimony. That should be the prayer and testimony of every, uh, of every father here this evening. And uh, can the Lord say that about us? Would the Lord be able to give us that stamp of uh, endorsement, that approval? You know, every May here we have a, a graduation service and the seniors have an opportunity to tape a little message. And uh, many of them are very similar. Uh, most of the time they'll say something to start with such as, you know, I can't believe I'm actually graduating. And we're like, we can't believe you're graduating either. <laughs> not really, not really. But they say some very similar things. There was one testimony, this is years ago, that I've never forgotten. And the testimony went something like this. Mom and Dad, thanks so much for providing the opportunity for me to have a Christian education. And Mom, I knew that when I came downstairs every morning, I would find you on the couch with a cup of coffee and your Bible. And when I walked out the door every morning, I knew 
that you were praying for me. And I don't know why, but that just really got a hold of my heart. I thought, what a powerful testimony to consistently be able to not only say it, but to model it in front of your children, to model it in front of your daughter to the point where that's something that she would acknowledge you in public and say, thanks for being consistent. Thanks for loving me. Thanks for praying for me. I'm sure there were many days when she had some bad days at school, potentially, but knowing, hey, my mom prayed for me this morning. That's an opportunity we all have uh, as parents and as grandparents. A stamp of approval basically saying, I know Abraham. I know him in verse number 19. He will command his children and his household after him. So now, as we, as we progress through what is happening here, basically he's saying, look, I'm going to destroy the cities of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, verse number, would you go with me down to uh, verse number 23, where it says, And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Hmm, good question here. One of the things that, uh, that we have to... I mean, that we, we sometimes think about, if you're like me, I'm reading the Bible, and I think, whoa, that's, that's a little bit bold, you know, to approach God. But hey, you know what? God's our creator. He made us. He gave us a mind to think. He knows our heart. And so it comes as no surprise to us to realize that at, from time to time we have questions, and, and God's not offended by our questions. He loves us. He wants the best for us. And he wants to to give us direction in his life if, if we'll allow him to do that. And so he's saying, uh, okay, you're going to destroy these people, but what if, there were, what if there were 50 people, God, that were righteous? Abraham asked God a very good question. Will you destroy the righteous along with the wicked? All right? And so Abraham uh, asked the question here in verse number 23. With Lot, the back of his mind, Abraham says... Hey, what if there were 50? Would you spare the city? And you know the story. And the pleading goes back and forth from 50 to 45 to 40 to 30 to 20 to 10. Now, Abraham must be thinking, look, there's Lot and his wife and his two daughters and son-in-laws. That's six. Is there any possibility that there were at least four individuals in Sodom that lived in the city of Sodom? Uh, that would be righteous, that wanted to do the right thing. But the truth of the matter is, there was not. And so we look at what takes place here. God had, uh, Abraham might have supposed that Lot and his family had a spiritual influence on at least four people. People maybe that lived beside him or people that he had business dealings with. You know, and, and they, they were not of the ilk of Sodom and Gomorrah, but, but that was not the case. God had told Jonah that he would destroy the wicked city of Nineveh unless they repented, a city of 120,000. And, and what Jonah needs to do is go and preach repentance, and you know what happened. He went down to Joppa, and he bought a ticket for the furthest place away. Uh, we don't know exactly know where Tarshish is, but Bible scholars say, you know, it's probably in Spain. <laughs> That's a long way away. And he paid the fare, but aboard the ship, they threw him overboard, right? He said, it's me. I'm in disobedience. And uh, the storm will calm down if you'll throw me overboard. What, what was his fear about Nineveh? Well, Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. They were the enemies of God. Nineveh want, Jonah wanted Nineveh to die. He wanted them to be wiped out. He wanted his reputation. See, it was all about Jonah and his thoughts. And he lost sight of the fact that God was going to use him if he would obey. Finally, when he gets there, he preaches repentance. And then what is his response? Not what you'd expect for a revival that brought 120,000 to righteousness. The Bible says in Jonah chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. And what he wanted to do was to go eventually and cry about their wickedness without the compassionate heart to see them repent and to do exactly what God said that he would do. And so Jonah pouted. The Bible says in verse number 10, and God saw their works that they had turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them and he did it not because of their repentance and Jonah had a pity party. You know, 
The Lord is not slack, the Bible tells us in verse 3, I mean chapter 3, verse 9 of 2 Peter, concerning what? His promises. We've talked about promises for several weeks now. The promise to Abraham. But it is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so then we see Lot meets two angels at the gate of Sodom and begs them to get inside his house for their safety. If you read down through the latter part here of chapter 18 and the first part of chapter number 19, we see what takes place here. You see, the angels show up there, and their idea is, ah, we can just stay out here this evening, and Lot is absolutely not. You have no idea. You, he insisted, you must come, and you must stay in the house. So what happened? Well, in the house later in the evening, look at what we have on the screen. The men of Sodom, both old and young, demanded that Lot bring out the two men for the purpose of violating them. That was the wickedness in which Abraham, oh, excuse me, Lot found himself. You know, uh, three months ago, on video, there was a march through the streets of New York City. Here's the headline. We're coming for your children, was the chant from the drag march elitists or, uh, that elicits outrage. Now, they would say, yeah, we said it, but we said it in jest. Listen, it always starts in jest, right? It always starts as something funny. And then it gets very, very serious when we find out what their intent was. And I remember 30 years ago, all right, 19, however, what, whenever that was, uh, 93, I guess, would be 30 years ago, there was a church, and I won't mention the name or where it was, but they had a special guest speaker who was family-oriented. He was given a session, kind of like we do for our marriage retreats here. And uh, somehow the public got a hold of it, and they found out that he uh, preached what the Bible says about one man, one woman for life, right? And uh, what the Bible taught about homosexuality. And a bunch of homosexual elitists came around the church when they found that out. I don't know if you remember this or not, but they did damage to the outside of the church. They tore the flag down, uh, both the Christian flag and the American flag, and stomped on it and spray-painted. And then when they noticed the children in the church. I remember hearing the video, uh, the audio, sorry, of the chants. They were chanting, we're coming for your children. We're coming for your children. And honestly, it was, it was, it was enough to make you just think to yourself, what in the world are we into? This was 30 years ago. Listen, the agenda has not changed. They're still after our children. Why do you think they go into the libraries and have these book readings? Um, the most inconceivable part of this account, that as a dad, I, I, can't, I can't fathom this, is that Lot was so caught up in the lifestyle of affluence, perhaps, prestige there in Sodom, that what did he do? Well, here's the solution. You can't have these men, but I have two daughters. Can you imagine that? That's just... It's hard for us to understand. He says in verse 8, I pray you bring them out unto you and do you that to them as good in your own eyes, only unto these men do nothing. For therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. It's not an easy thing to think about what Sodom said and the effect that Sodom had on Lot. Well, Lot had to be pulled back in to the house for his safety and the perpetrators as a result the Bible says we're blinded. If you look at verse number 11, and they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great. We don't know if it was temporary or whether it was permanent, but that was an effect. The effect was they didn't know where they were, and so they stumbled away. Lot was then given instructions to take all of his family members and get out of Sodom because the warning had been given the city was about to be destroyed. God was getting ready to take it down. The idea is run for your lives. Take, uh, just take what you have and go and get out. But it's amazing that Lot uh, procrastinated, that he didn't immediately obey. The idea is get out of Dodge. There's bad news coming. There, it'd be like somebody warning you that a terrible storm is coming and you refuse perhaps to go uh, to seek shelter. And that's where we find Lot. 
It's interesting that Lot is afraid to be away from the city. That's what the Bible says. And to flee under the hills where there would be safety. He ends up in the city, another city uh, called Zoar. As God begins to rain fire and brimstone, a word that we use in our Bible that is, uh, is a translation or uh, a depiction of sulfur, all right? And uh, great destruction upon the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. The Bible says in chapter 19, verses 18 and 19, And Lot said unto them, Oh, not so, my Lord. Be not, behold now, thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which hath showed unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some, what? In the mountain, some evil take me and I die. That's an example of the thinking here on the part of Lot. The danger was where he was, and yet he supposed that the danger was in the mountains, which was a place of safety, which was where he was uh, asked to go, where he was told to go. This map here gives us an idea. You see at the bottom of the Dead Sea there, the area of Moab, and there's five cities there. And they believe, uh, biblical archaeologists have really done an awful lot in the last 10 years at this location. The only thing is, what do you look for? Well, you look for a lot of sulfur. And indeed, the minerals that they're pulling out of the Dead Sea are very, very valuable. Uh, and we think about that as a, a specific location. This is what we're talking about. Biblical Zoar is known today as a place called Asafi. And they're able to, uh, to, they're able to do archaeological digs there, but it's not nearly as old as it goes back to the days of Abraham. Okay? It goes back to the days of the Romans uh, for the most part. So the angels had given instructions to Lot and his family to escape into the hills, not to stop anywhere, and not to do what? Don't look back. And here's part of the story. We've remembered it from our days of Sunday school. The Bible says in verse number 17, um, it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, escape for thy life, look not behind thee. There's part of the specific instructions that are given there. Don't look back. All right? Well, what happened? Well, Lot's wife disobeyed, very simply. And what happened to her? Well, she became a pillar of salt. All right? Part of the consequence. Look at what it says here in Genesis 19, verse 26. His wife looked back from behind him, and she became what? A pillar of salt. In Luke 17, Jesus addresses the Pharisees and contrasts what is of eternal value and what is fleeting. And he illustrates this by referencing... This passage that we're talking about here, he references Lot and the story of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And if you look at this passage, it's rather small print there on the screen, but he says, likewise, also, it was in the days of Lot. They did eat, they drank, they, brought, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. I mean, that's why Lot was there. Apparently, he was pretty prosperous. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed in that day, he shall, uh, in which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house. Let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Three words. Remember Lot's wife. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. It reminds me of the story of Jim Elliott. Most of you are aware of that story. 1956, five missionaries went down to Ecuador, and they tried to reach the, um, the Aka Indians there, one of them being Jim Elliott. And, of course, they were martyred there. But the famous quote there from uh, Jim Elliott is, he is no fool who gives up that which he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. What a powerful statement. Uh, my father, who was a missionary... That, that particular phrase and the life of Jim Elliott had a big part in my dad going to the mission field. They were killed in 19, I believe it was 52, I think I said 1956, I'm not sure. But the point that we're, that we're trying to make and what, what is being made here is that life is fleeting. And that many times we find ourselves living for the beyond here on this earth as opposed to storing up treasure in heaven. You know... Uh, Years ago, Brother Don Sisk came here uh, for a missions conference, and uh, what a blessing he was. He was a longtime missionary in Japan, and, and he led BIMI, uh, Baptist International Missions, and then uh, spent some time as, I think, an adjunct professor at um, West Coast Baptist College, 
just a powerful testimony. He wrote a couple of books. I would encourage you to read his life story. It's an amazing story of his life and his wife who's now in heaven. But, you know, he stood right here and he gave an illustration that I thought was so simple and so profound at the same time. And, uh, and, and the illustration went like this. He said, uh, Church, I, I want to thank you for the accommodations Brother Weber, you might remember this. I don't know. But he said, I want to thank you for the accommodations. The room was wonderful. The bowl of fruit uh, that you gave us was just, was just lovely. But he said, you know, he said, believe it or not, the first night we were there, my wife said, honey, this, this hotel room is really nice, but I think we ought to change the wallpaper. You know, and we're thinking, okay, now he's going a different direction. What's he talking about? And he said, so we went down here to Lowe's, and we got some wallpaper, and and we put wallpaper over the wallpaper that was on the hotel room. And she said the next day she wanted the carpet changed. He said, you know, you got to do what, you, what your wife wants. And so we went down to Lowe's. We got some carpet. We tore out. And so we knew where he was going at this point. He's like, what? What is he talking about? And he said, you don't believe me, do you? And he said, that would be ridiculous. That would be absurd. But his point was, as as absurd as it would be just to be staying in a hotel for three or four or five nights, to take the effort to redo that hotel room, which was plenty comfortable and nothing wrong with it, by the same token, what do we do? We live our whole life here. It's like four or five days in a hotel room, and we're moving on. The Bible says we're pilgrims. We're sojourners here on this earth. So where are we storing up our treasure? For Lot, it was in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And for us, to have eternal fruit, the Bible says, where moth and rust doth not corrupt, that thieves do not break through and steal. And it can be of eternal value. Furthermore, it's evident that Lot's sons-in-laws had chosen to ignore the warning and remain in Sodom. That was part of the tragedy as well. They mocked Lot. They mocked his God. They didn't believe him. The Bible says in verse 16, And while they lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters. And the Lord being merciful unto them, this is it, you got to go now. Let's go. Grabbing them, they brought them forth and set him without the city as the fire and brimstone began to rain down. You know, uh, Lot becomes afraid of living in the city. And what does he do? He ends up going into uh, the mountains that he was so afraid of at one time, living in the caves along with his two daughters. Well, Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he would stand before the Lord, verse 27, 28 of this passage. And he looks towards Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and beheld, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. Imagine Maybe some of you that have lived in areas where they're susceptible to wildfire. And at night, especially as you see the glow of the fires, as they're just burning acre after acre of land, that must have been what it was like for, for, for uh, Abraham to look and to see what was, what was left of the cities that were burning up. About that time that you think that things cannot get any worse, they do. And it's not pleasant to think about. But this is what the Bible tells us happened. Both of Lot's daughters are involved in an incestuous relationship with her father as a result of his drunkenness. Boy, there's a lot of, a lot of points there we could park on. Um, and Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld, the, the Bible says, um, we can be reminded that life is built on choices. And that choice that was made back in chapter number 13 about the well-watered plains of Jordan Lot's choices resulted in a violation. Here it is in verse number 10. Lot lifted up his eyes, beheld the plain of Jordan. It was well watered. The other location, I don't think we'll prosper going that direction. Well, guess what? Abraham did. God took care of him. And uh, the verse that we see in Psalm 1, and verse 1, we looked at two or three weeks ago. Blessed is the man that doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, doesn't stand in the way of sinners, doesn't sit in the seat of the scornful, and there's steps one, two, and three in Lot's life. He looked, he moved his tent, and finally he's sitting in the gate as one of the prominent members of this community. And look at where it results. The result is that Lot is mentioned in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 6 and 8, and is described as just and righteous. What? How does that happen? Just and 
and righteous. The result of the sin that took place there in the cave, I think I skipped over that and I didn't mean to, I'm sorry, but you could fill in the word enemies right there. So the result is the creation of the nations of the Moabites and the Ammonites. Both groups of people will prove to be what? They'll be enemies of the descendants of Abraham. Now, this idea of just Lot is the next, next heading there. We'll look at this uh, just briefly. Turning the cities of God and delivered just Lot. That doesn't mean just Lot. It means Lot was a just man. Vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. <clears throat> what we see here is that in verse 23 of Deuteronomy chapter 29, look at what it says. And that the whole land thereof is brimstone and salt and burning, that it is not sown nor beareth, nor any grass groweth therein, like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah and Adam and Zeboam, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and in his wrath. So the Bible doesn't tell us what happened to Lot after the incident that takes place there in the cave. And so in light of the fact that we don't have all the details, what we do know according to the New Testament is that, uh, is that Lot must have changed his ways and there must have been repentance on his part for that to be recorded in Scripture. We know that he witnessed his uncle Abraham's failings and his repentance. And we assume that that was the role and the model that was provided for Lot. I've sinned. I've done some things that are wrong. I need to ask God to forgive me. And God forgave Abraham for lack of faith and lying about his wife. And by the same token, God can forgive Lot for what took place. So Peter describes him as what? As a righteous man. Now, according to what we read, we wouldn't call him a righteous man. But God isn't finished with him. And which only means that at some point a change was made in his life. Filling in the blank there. Unfortunately, Lot did not influence Sodom. I mentioned this earlier, but Sodom influenced Lot. And so we are reminded of what the Apostle Paul told the church at Corinth regarding the sins of the unrighteous. What did he say? There in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 9 through 11. Know ye not that the righteous, unrighteous, sorry, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived. Neither, here it is, here's a list, okay? Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, abusers of themselves with mankind, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Ooh, I've got it in parentheses, not in parentheses, but emphasis there. And such were some of you, and here they are in the church at Corinth. Now, Apostle Paul had to write two letters to the church at Corinth, and they're long letters. Try to help them. But here they are. Such, such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Truth of the matter is God can take the lowliest of sinners, which by the way is me and you, and he can wash us, he can cleanse us, he can use us as he desires uh, to do. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I don't know what your past is. I don't know what your background is. Some of you may be in here and you say, boy, I would be terribly embarrassed to think about if the church folks here knew what I had done. But the, that's, that's the part where Satan might say, you know what? Uh, you better sit on the sidelines because I don't think uh, God will really use you. And that's the lie of the devil. If you've been washed and you've been cleansed, and God's forgiven you, and you're a child of God. He's given you what? He's given you new life. And uh, we can move on. You know, I think about the thief on the cross. The good thief, as they refer to him, compared to the bad thief, right? The good thief. What, what was his, his idea? What was his attitude? And one of the malefactors, which were hanged, railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. Wow, what an attitude. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God? seeing thou art in the same condemnation. Look at these words. And we indeed justly, we're up here because we deserve it. For we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man, this man hath done nothing amiss. And yet what happened? Well, the, the other part of the verse there, verse 42 and 43, 
Wow, what a testimony. Jesus said to him, remember, he said to Jesus, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, verily I say unto thee, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. This man did not have a chance to get baptized. He did not join People's Baptist Church. He should have, all right? He was not a, he never taught a Sunday school class, never drove a bus, never did all the things. But God took his heart and changed it. You know, uh, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. But according to his mercy, Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, Paul reminded uh, Titus of this. And that's us here this evening. We have a tendency to think about sin in terms of, oh, terrible sins, as opposed to, well, you know, these, these aren't so bad. And here's the lie that Satan likes to use on us, is we can compare ourselves to, wow, look at them, my goodness, look at what they have done. Can you believe that? And we can get all puffed up in our own pride and realize it's us. The chiefest of sinners, Paul said, we can add our name to that list. And yet God, who is faithful and just, can provide salvation for us. All right? I can't go three weeks without talking about my hero. All right? Corey Ten Boom. So what's the story? The story that many of you know is that she ended up in a concentration camp because she was Dutch. And during World War II, uh, she and her family were responsible for saving the lives of eight hundred Jews. Part of that was the hiding place in their home. And, uh, but when they were arrested and taken to prison, the end result is that her father was killed, her brother was killed, and her sister Betsy died there in Ravensbrück, which is just, just outside of Berlin. When she was there, 90,000 women were in that concentration camp. It was an all-female concentration camp. After she walked out the doors, all 90,000 of them were exterminated. They found out that the reason that she was released was clerical error. And that was the Lord changing the paperwork and saying, I've got a big plan for you. But you know, God really worked in her heart. Two years after, after leaving Ravensbrück in 1947, she visited Germany. And uh, she taught and, and uh, conveyed the message of forgiveness to the German people who were there, who were sitting there just blank faces, like how in the world could we ever be forgiven for what we've done? It was the truth they needed most to hear in that bitter, bombed-out land. And she said, and I gave them my favorite mental picture, maybe because the sea is never far from a Hollander's mind, and that's because a lot of their land is actually below sea level. They've reclaimed it from the land, and they're always concerned about the, the big earthen works and, and dams to hold out the water. I like to think that that's where forgiven sins were thrown. When we confess our sins, I said, God cast them into the deepest ocean, gone forever. She said, the solemn faces stared back at me, not quite daring to believe. How could that be? There were never questions after a talk in Germany in 1947. People stood up in silence, and in silence they collected their wraps, and in silence they left the room. They couldn't talk about it. And that's when I saw him, she said, working his way toward me. One, mo mo uh, one moment I saw the overcoat and the brown hat. The next, a blue uniform and a visored cap with its skull and crossbones. Betsy and I had been arrested for concealing Jews in our home during the Nazi uh, occupation of Holland, and she said, we ended up in Robinsbrook. Now he was in front of me, hand thrust out. And he said to her, a fine message, Fräulein. How good it is to know that as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And I, she said, who have spoken so glibly about forgiveness, fumbled in my pocketbook rather than take that hand. He would not remember me, of course. How could he remember one prisoner among 90,000 women? She said, but I remembered him and the leather crop swinging from his belt. It was the first time since my release that I had been face to face with one of my captors. And she said, and my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk, he was saying. I was a guard in there. No, he did not remember me. But since that time he went on, I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there. But I would like to hear it from your lips as well, Fräulein. Again, the hand came out. 
will you forgive me? And she said, I stood there, I who since had every day to be forgiven and could not. Betsy had died in that place. Her family had been erased as a result of these men. How could she erase her slow, terrible death simply for the asking? It could not have been many seconds that he stood there, hand held out, but to me it seemed hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I ever had to do. She said, for I had to do it. I knew that. I had preached it. I had taught it. The message that God forgives has a prior condition, and that is that we have forgiven those who have injured us. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, Jesus said, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. And still I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will. And the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. She said, Jesus, help me. She said, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that. I can take his hand. But you have to supply the feeling. And so woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, and sprang into our joined hands. And then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. And you know what the world has to say about that? Ah, it's not real. Don't tell me that's not real. That's the love of God spread abroad that has affected us. If you know who you are this evening as a child of God, we've experienced that same forgiveness. Now, we weren't SS guards, but our sin would prevent us from knowing, uh, from uh, being able to get to heaven. And uh, the mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ, came to a manger that we celebrate, but didn't remain in a manger, went to a cross and died for our sins. Would you stand and let's be dismissed in prayer. And we'll thank the Lord for the hope that we have this time of the year and for forgiveness. Lord, I thank you for all the blessings that you have given to us. And uh, I thank you for Corey's life and her testimony. And she's just one individual, but, but uh, what a role model for us. There may be people in this auditorium this evening that are holding grudges or have ought against others. And Lord, help us to realize that that we can't ask forgiveness in our own heart from you if we hold those against others. And so I pray that that would be something real in our life. I pray that um, you would uh, continue to bless the, the preaching and the, and the reading of your word. And this time of the year, as we think about our Savior and what he did for us, taking our place on Calvary, that we could have eternal life, I pray that we'd be found faithful. And thank you, Lord, for all the blessings that you give us uh, here in the United States of America. We are a blessed people, and I pray that we uh, would have that attitude of thankfulness in our heart. And I pray you would bless us now as we come back to your house on Sunday. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you so much for coming this evening, and you are dismissed.